Hey everyone, this is Anshul Sadaria, software engineer three at Google. Let me ask you a very fundamental question. Okay, let's say you are a developer and you have hosted a website on some server. Now you are facing some server capacity constraints. Your user base is increasing, your traffic is increasing. You are getting a like lot more concurrent request. What will you do? There is an end of systems capacity that you have currently. Your ideal choice. Okay, now if I were a student, my ideal answer or my fundamental answer would be. If I'm using a server with four CPUs or four GPUs, let's say, and I have a RAM of 16 GB, for example, then I ideally would want to upgrade my system from 16 GB to 32 GB or increase the number of cores so that the processing speed increases and I am able to cater more traffic. Now, for large-scale systems like Uber, YouTube, Maps, which have a lot more traffic than this, such system upgradation might not just work. they need to move like they need to make changes more fundamental changes to that to their overall system design and in this video i am going to talk about one such fundamental thing which is a part of almost every large scale system design that is caching but before we jump into the video make sure you check out scaler's free master classes taken by industry leading experts only on scaler's event page link is in the description below Now let's get started. Now let's begin with caching. I think we all have that deja vu kind of feeling, you know, when that techy friend of yours, suppose for example your application is not working, it's hanging a lot. So that techy friend of yours will come and tell you that, hey, did you try and delete your cache? Obviously, he has no idea what cache actually means, but that solution works for a lot of us. Now let me try to explain what cache is in a more layman terms. Let's say your mother wants to cook something for the dinner. and she identifies that okay there is butter in the refrigerator there is cheese in the refrigerator as well you have olive oil okay now you guessed it right yes i am making pasta uh, i have tomatoes with me as well but i don't have pasta okay so what will be your next step your next step will be to go to the grocery store and bring pasta naturally right but now this is a costly operation let's say if you had pasta within your kitchen in your refrigerator or store room then it would be so much easier for you this is exactly what caching is if the information or the data pre is present in the cache itself then we don't need to go and fetch it from the database the disk ios reduced tremendously and okay let me put it into different words let's say you go to the grocery store as well okay you get pasta along with it you will get other things also which you might require to prepare for tomorrow's breakfast lunch or dinner and so on right in the same way when something is not found in the cache we go to the database fetch it from the database and bring it to the cache itself so that it can be referenced in the future so ideally the concept of cache is like this if you anticipate the usage of some data or some item from the database you want to bring it to the cache because the cost of going to the grocery store aka the cost of taking things out from the database and writing to the database it's naturally going to be much much larger as compared to retrieving it from cache so this is what cache basically means in layman terms you want to store things inside cache for faster retrieval for faster access when your application is running now when i talk about cache there are different types of cache there is l1 cache then there is l2 cache don't worry i am going to throw some technical jargon at you but with time you will be able to understand what i actually meant okay so now let me fundamentally explain how caching works in a system okay in a computer system how does caching works let's say you get some request now it tries to fetch from the database now this is the db So when the request comes it asks something from the database and the information which is requested is returned to the user right but now this is a costly operation now if you want to find an analogy you will realize that going to the grocery store is quite costly you need to walk you need to spend some time you need to burn some calories as well perhaps your fuel as well so it's a very costly operation and we want to minimize on those costly operations as much as possible so what we do is instead of fetching it directly from the database instead of fetching it directly from the database we will put in a caching system in between now this is a cache let's forget about l1 and l2 for right now and no it's not the visa thing i'm talking about it's the cache uh, so let's forget about l1 l2 right now and this is our database 
सो वैन द रिक्वेस्ट कम्स इट कम्स थ्रू सम सॉर्ट ऑफ एन एप्लीकेशन सर्वर ओके द एप्लीकेशन सर्वर इज द सर्वर ओन्ड बाई योर सिस्टम इट सेल्फ लाइक यू आर होस्टिंग द वेबसाइट ऑन सम सर्वर सो दैट इज द एप्लीकेशन सर्वर आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट सो लेट्स रिफर इट एज सर्वर इट सेल्फ सो वैन सम रिक्वेस्ट कम्स टू द सर्वर इट फर्स्ट आस्क द कैश दैट हे डू यू हैव दिस इन्फॉर्मेशन और नॉट इफ द इन्फॉर्मेशन इज फाउंड देन द इन्फॉर्मेशन इज रिट्रीव फ्रॉम द कैश इट सेल्फ दिस इज नोन एज कैश हिट ओके इफ द इन्फॉर्मेशन इज फाउंड देन इट्स नोन एज कैश हिट and then we don't need to go to the database and fetch that information from the database and return to the user so in this way we reduce the hop of fetching from the database and retrieving it to the user now let's say if the information was not present in the cache okay then it's known as a cache miss cache miss if the information was not there so now what will you do if there is a cache miss naturally there are two ways either the cache or the server either of them can ask the database that hey the information is not present in the cache can you give me this information so this information is then returned to the server directly there are two ways either the information can be returned to the cache and the cache can return the information to the server we will cover both of those approaches in detail further down the video or the database can directly return the information to the server itself and then the server's responsibility is to store it in the cache because it was recently received now this is what we mean by cache hit and cache miss now let me explain it in more proper way that for example in the cache there is some information already present one is already present and in the database also one two and three this three pieces of data is already present now if the server wants to ask for one it will first ask the cache and since the information is already present in the cache one is already present so we will return the result or the one the data one from the cache itself now let's say it asks for two all right the server requires two now it will ask the cache the cache will be like i only have one i don't have two with me so we will retrieve the information from the database two is present in the database and we will return it to the user meanwhile we will also store the missing two in the cache so that in future if the request for two comes in again we can return it from the cache itself instead of fetching it from the database now this is how cache normally works i mean if you look at the large system it's much more complicated and i'll explain what all different read strategies are there what all different write strategies are there and i will also explain some of the other concepts around it now you must be wondering if cache is such an amazing thing why can't we store all the information inside the cache okay now here's a catch catch and cache both of them are different thing so here's a catch now cache has costly hardware and that is the reason it has a limited memory okay for example if you have a rom of 528 gb or we have all this 1 terabyte gb you know 1 terabyte uh, rom now the ram is 16 gb or 32 gb in usual cases depending upon what laptop or what system you are using but cache is much more smaller as compared to a ram as well so we cannot store all the information because of the cost issues now when i talked about l1 and l2 l1 is much much faster as compared to l2 but much much costlier as well and that is the trade off we need to manage and that is the reason l1 is smaller in size as compared to l2 and so on like after l2 it comes the memory and from the memory it goes to the database so that is the hierarchy from l1 l2 this is the memory and this is the disk or database okay now l1 is much faster and much more costlier as well and that is the reason we have those storage issues in cache and we cannot store everything in the cache itself now let me talk about some definition related to the terms that you will hear in the few, like in this video down the lane okay one such thing is cache eviction don't worry i'm going to explain this in detail what all cache eviction policies are there and the other thing is cache invalidation now imagine a situation let me create a cache as, as well now let's say in the cache there is space for only three data objects all right and it is already filled with 1 2 and 3 so now let's say if we have a request for four we will like obviously 
in the cache 4 is not present so we are going to bring it from the database when we bring it from the database the database is like i need to put in 4 in the cache itself so that the request comes for 4 next time we are going to fetch it from the cache itself but since the cache is full okay since the cache is full we need to get rid of one of these objects 1 2 or 3 1 2 or 3 we need to get rid of one of them in order to create some space to store 4 in it now this is known as cache eviction this usually hap this obviously happens not usually this obviously happens when the cache is full okay and in order to get rid of some data point from the cache there are different cache eviction policies which we are going to discuss in this video in detail now coming to the cache invalidation okay let's say let me create a database this is a database and i am storing a key value pair over here one is corresponding to let's say my name anshul okay ansh let's keep it there and two is corresponding to ram for example now in the cache both one and two are present one two and three all three of them are present okay let's assume that three is also there in the database somewhere now this is the database so now what will happen is let's say there is a database update corresponding to one i change from anshul to perhaps rohit okay so the database will get updated but in the cache there is an entry from one to anshul itself okay so let me just get rid of Anshul from the database and I put in Rohit over here all right now corresponding to one in the cache there is already Anshul I have not got rid of the Anshul in the cache now this is when cache invalidation methods come into play because something has got updated in the database and the information inside the cache is either stale or inconsistent so this is also known as cache inconsistency so we need to make sure that the cache at any moment is not inconsistent either we can get rid of this entire data entry altogether like we can just remove one anshul altogether or we need to update the entry from one anshul to one rohit okay so any of these tactics they, these are the part of cache invalidation strategies or cache invalidation policy so we are going to cover both of these in quite detail but i just wanted to let you know what both of these actually mean so now let us jump on to the next concept now before understanding the next concepts let's first understand what are the advantages and disadvantages of using a caching mechanism now obviously some of the advantages are quite intuitive for example the first one being better performance now that was the reason why we introduced caching now the second one being lesser load on database now since we are fetching a lot of things from the cache itself naturally the load on database will be lesser and the retrieval cost or any updating cost also reduces naturally now if you remember i talked about cache miss and cache hit right so we would naturally want this ratio to be much higher okay we want our cache hits to be much more than cache misses and we want to prepare algorithms in such a way that it is as optimal and as higher as possible okay if this is higher then naturally the load on the database will be lesser but if we create some cache eviction policies such that that whenever we try to hit the cache it always results in a cache miss okay then we are naturally going to get it from the database and this is not going to reduce the load on the database so we want such policies which help us to reduce the load on the database as well and lastly it helps to reduce the expenses now you would be like you mentioned that cache is a costly hardware so how is it reducing the expenses so for example let's assume you are facing some performance issues you want to increase the number of cores so you have two options with you either you can increase the memory or the number of cores in your system by purchasing some costly gpus or cpus or something like that or you can have a mechanism of introducing cache in front of you now there is a trade-off between both of them increasing the additional capacity by purchasing a new system or adding a caching mechanism so there is a trade-off but ideally it has been found that having a smaller memory cache which is faster in retrieval helps you to reduce expenses by a lot now let's understand what all are the disadvantages now you must be like cache is such a great system what all disadvantages can be there 
Now, if you remember, I already mentioned some of the disadvantages to you earlier. One of which is the eviction. Now, when the cash gets full, we want to get rid of some data point from the cash and make space for the new data point, which is fetched from the database. Now, if the cash eviction policy is not designed properly, it can lead to a lot of inefficiencies and the performance optimization that we are expecting due to cash, it might not happen. And that is the reason why we want to like increase the number of cash hits against cash miss. Now, the second disadvantage is data inconsistency, which also we discussed earlier, right? Now, if something is updated in the database, we want the fresh information to be available in the cache or we don't want that information to be available in cache at all. Okay, we cannot risk that. Okay, if you remember the previous example, we updated one Anshul to one Rohit, right? So now if someone asks the cache that, hey, give me the value corresponding to one, then the cache will return Anshul itself, which is not the right information. So we need to avoid those data risks. Now, this is a very trivial information. Someone might be storing their bank account number or some, some other sort of thing, which is very informative and like privacy related. Okay. So we want the data inconsistency to not be there at all. We want the data to be as fresh as possible. And if not, the data should not be present in the cache. But we cannot risk data inconsistency. And last point is increased complexity. Now, when I talk about increased complexity, I'm talking about the complexity of the entire system design. If you are introducing one new component in your system design, it is going to lead to newer eviction policies, newer invalidation policies and so on. So the coding part or the development part on the application developer or the cache developer also increases along with the maintenance of cache itself. So it's a costly affair overall in terms of added complexity as well. But there is a trade off related to the performance and that is why we prefer having caching systems in almost every system, every large scale system you look around. So cache is going to be there, but we need to be aware about what all cache eviction policies we are using, how we are getting rid of the old data and how we are trying to minimize the complexity in the system design as much as possible. Now I kept on talking about eviction policies again and again. So now it's time to understand what all different cache eviction policies are there. Let me note them down first and then we'll go to each one of them in detail. The first one is LRU and this is something which you must have heard a lot of times if you are a computer science student. Okay, just to expand it, it's the least recently used. The second one being MRU and it's the opposite of the previous one, most recently used it is. And the third one being most frequently used. Now I will explain the difference between all of them. So don't worry about it. Yes, there are a few more. Uh, it's random replacement. I'll just put in random over here. And now if you are aware about stacks, then you would know there is something known as FIFO. First in first out. And then there is LIFO, last in, first out. So now let's go and understand all of these eviction policies in detail. Now, least recently used makes a lot of sense when we talk about, let, let me just prepare some cache as well, so that this makes more sense. Okay, now this is our cache. There are three elements inside cache, one, two, and three. Now, when we want to make space for a new information inside cache, for least recently used or LRU, I will ask one question. Out of all the three elements, which one is the least recently used? So we will Id ideally have some timestamp associated with all of them that, okay, this is the timestamp when it was recently used, like whatever is the last access timestamp. Now, out of one, two, and three, whichever one was used the oldest, we will get rid of that particular element and make space for the new one. So, if you, if I want to give you an example in terms of a real life application, let's say, for example, the time when MS Dhoni retired, you know, he put in that post that at 19.29 hours, I retire from cricket, international cricket, obviously, we expect him to come in IPL next year as well. But at that time, 
a lot of people were going to his profile on Instagram and trying to watch the video that he had posted. So what would happen is that naturally that post is going to be a lot more accessible as compared to other posts and that post is going to be the part of cash in Instagram's profile or Instagram system. Okay. So now as that post gets older or staler, let's say he posted on 15th August, I don't remember to be very honest, but after 30 days or so that post will become like that post will cool down and naturally it will get out of the cash system. Like it will make space for a new viral post which might be coming or a new viral profile which is coming. So that is what least recently used means. We get rid of the element which was accessed the earliest or which is the oldest present element inside the cache. Now most recently used is completely opposite. And you might be wondering that ideally we would want to get rid of the element which is older, which is staler. We want to keep the fresh elements inside the cache so that it is accessed quickly. Now let me give you an example. Uh, if you have not seen the system design video of Tinder, which I prepared, uh, make sure you check it out because let's say you are on a dating application. Okay, you are swiping some people left and right. Now, ideally what Tinder does is it stores those profiles in the cache, which you are most likely to swipe, ideally swipe right. But yeah, that is how the caching system in any dating application works. Okay, now let's say you swiped a profile left or right. You don't want the same profile to come again, right? It would be a really bad user experience if I swiped someone left and the same profile is coming again and again. I'm like, I have swiped it left. I don't want it again. So naturally, we are going to use most recently used the eviction policy in that to get rid of that profile which we have recently used from the caching system. Okay, so in this case, I will just ask one, two and three the same thing I asked earlier that which one of you was most recently accessed? Which one of you is the freshest, freshest one and then get rid of it. Okay, now I hope LRU and MRU both of them make sense to you. Now the third one is most frequently used. Now we all use a lot of emojis in our mobile phone, right? So not exactly like MFU is not exactly used in emojis, but if you have noticed it neither uses LRU or MRU. For example, if I get some emoji from the entire database corpus of the emojis, let's say I uh, got some heart emoji, okay, which was not present in the recently used emojis tab that we have. So ideally we would want that emoji to be the part of the recently used ones but it is not present at the top of that list. Okay. And that is the reason they use something known as most frequently used. For example, one, two and three. Now one might be the most recently used and three might be the least recently used one, but it might be two, which is most frequently used. Like people are using it more and more again and again. And that is how the ordering of the cache might happen for certain applications like emojis, wherein we want to put the most recently used one. Okay, my bad. I have explained something completely opposite over here. Now this needs to be least frequently used. We want to get rid of something which is least frequently used. Yep. So this is an eviction policy and not adding it to the cash policy. So in terms of eviction policy, we want to get rid of something which is least frequently used. So something which is used more and more often again, that is going to be the part of cash, irrespective of the fact if it was used 30 days ago or used just one hour ago. Okay. There can be something which was used 30 days ago, but it was used 100 times in a day, for example. Okay. That still might be present in the cash as compared to some element which was just used yesterday, but just used once. Okay, so in certain situations, LRU must, might be more preferable in certain situations, MRU might be more preferable and in certain, certain situation, LFU might be more preferable. It depends on the use case, which eviction policy we want to use. Now the simplest one is going to be random replacement. We don't want to make our heads turn crazy. Whatever element is present, just point a finger at it. We are going to get rid of it as simple as that. Okay. Let me just draw the cache over here as well. So as simple as that is, we just randomly choose an element from the cache and get rid of it. Now, first in, first out and last in, first out. If you are familiar with stacks and queues, you might be aware what these terms mean. Now, irrespective of the number of times it was accessed or irrespective of when it was accessed. Okay. For example, let me go back to the previous uh, page. So let's say I accessed one 30 days ago, I accessed two 15 days ago and I accessed three. 
वन डे अगो ओके आई जस्ट पुट इन दोज डेज थर्टी डेज फिफ्टीन डेज एंड वन डे अगो now naturally in least recently used i am going to get rid of one in most recently used i am going to get rid of three now what happens in first in first out first in first out doesn't care when it was accessed okay it is very much possible that the element 3 was added to the cache first because it was accessed on the 31st day like 31 days before three was added to the cache and now recently when it was accessed again the element was present in the cache itself since from the 31st day to the first day the element was present in the cache itself okay uh, let me add some dates as well it was accessed on 1st gen and it was accessed on 31st gen as well so now when it was accessed on 1st gen we are going to add 3 to the cache okay now it is still in the cache we have not got out like we have not got 3 out of the cache on 31st gen it is accessed once again Okay so now it is the least recently used one if today's date is 1st feb but now when we go to fifo it will just ask one thing when was when were the elements added to the cache and get rid of the one which was added in the beginning so now when we look at it 1st gen 3 was added for the first time 1 was not added 2 was not added none of them were added only 3 was added at that at that time and it was the first one so we will get rid of 3 in this particular use case and for lifo it is completely opposite like whichever element was added to the cache the last it can be accessed like it can be more recently used it can be less recently used we don't care about it but the element which was added to the cache in the end we are going to get rid of it as simple as that okay so these are six of the eviction policies and depending on the use case you need to choose one of them or probably create your own algorithm using multiple one of them Now we discuss some of the eviction policies. It time to move ahead and understand what all invalidation policies are there. First of all, I know it might be a lot of technical jargon, eviction, invalidation, inconsistency, and so on. So let us first understand what is inval like. What do I mean by invalidation over here, and why do we need it? I know we have discussed it earlier, but it might be lost in the moment of this video. So let us first understand why is invalidation policy required. Okay. so here there is a database and there is a cache in front of it let's say one has lol in front of it and in the cache also we have lol now for example we can update the value for one from lol to rofl or we can remove it all together let's say we removed it okay so now we don't want the cache to return some information which is not present in the database or we don't want the cache to be in an inconsistent state as compared to the database so ideally what we want is both of them are in sync with each other right if some data is present in the database we want the same data to be present in the cache and not something else if the database gets an update in the form of a deletion or a update as it is like if the value is updated or if the value is removed altogether we want to use some invalidation policies or write strategies so that the value in the cache is also updated okay so now let's understand what all different invalidation policies are there let me get rid of all of these jargon and we'll move on to the policies i hope you understood why we need invalidation policies and like in what situations we want to use those invalidation policies if not you can just add the comment below and i will be happy to answer them but it would be self intuitive by this time of the video so the first one being write through cache don't worry about the jargons i'm going to explain everything in detail i'll just mention the name of all of them and go through them one by one okay the second one being write around cache now i'm sure like with the language write through cache you have some thoughts inside your mind and you might be right i think you would be right like understanding it from an english point of view you would understand what it actually means and the third one being write back cache now let's go to the first one and understand in detail what does it mean let me first create a rough diagram this is the server which is going to send request for some data okay now this is the database and in between is our little cache 
Now what happens in write through cache is that if there is some sort of an update or write to the database itself that request will go through the cache. If that information is present inside the cache it will get updated and then it's the responsibility of the cache that hope okay hey uh, hey database this information is updated inside me let me update the same information inside you as well so for example we had one lol okay if it was updated to hmm or okay or some sort of other particular value then it will first be updated in the cache and then to the database so first it will be updated in the cache and next it will get updated in the db so in this way we ensure that whatever information is present in the database it is up to date because we are performing the write to the cache before the database so we are guaranteeing one thing if there is some sort of an update in the database it is already consistent in the cache now there is one disadvantage of this strategy we are performing writes at two places okay we are first making a write to the cache and then we are making a write to the database now let's say i added these two values Okay, for the sake of clarity, I just added lol in both of them. Now, let's say lol was never accessed during the reads. Now, the write that we performed in cache is completely useless if we are not going to access it in recent time. So, it depends on the use case. If the recently written or recently updated information is not going to be accessed, we should ideally not use this particular strategy. We will talk about some different strategy which might be beneficial for that, but. if our use case if our access pattern is such that the recently written data is not going to be accessed in the recent time then it is going to lead to higher write latencies so this is something which is a disadvantage higher write latencies okay so this is a trade off like we have a disadvantage but along with it we have something known as data consistency in our cache which is lot more important to us so depending on the use case we might choose this strategy to go ahead with now let's move on to the next one write around cache and i'll just just draw the same diagram once again very quickly server i won't use different colors this time uh cache and then there is a database now write around cache is like as the name like it's intuitive in the name itself that we are not going to write through the cache we are going to write around it so whenever a write comes whenever there is an update request okay let's update the database so we won't first make the amendments or make the changes in the cache we will make the changes only to the database we will bypass the cache altogether and just make the updates in the database so let's say if lol was added to the database it will just be present in the database and not in the cache at all So this is the difference between write through and write around and you can naturally see there is going to be a change in the write latency because earlier we were writing at two places and now we are writing only in the database. So this is the difference earlier we were writing first to cache and then to the database and now we are writing only to the database. Now this gets gets rid of the previous issue that we had we had a higher write latency and if the access pattern was such that the recently written information is not going to be read in a short duration of time then it's leading to higher write latencies so for those use case this is a work around we can use the write around cache and try to get rid of that disadvantage but now with this particular trade off we have another disadvantage in front of us what if the recently written data is going to be accessed okay what if the recently written data is going to be accessed by us in near future this is going to lead to higher read latencies because there there are going to be a lot more cache misses okay so let me just note that disadvantage down cache misses might increase and now again to just emphasize this this depends on the access pattern okay you would be like that okay in this situation why not use write through cache okay so these are two different access patterns in which one write strategy or one invalidation policy is better than the other one so write around cache can lead to more cache misses if the read pattern is in such a way that we are going to read the recently written data so if we read if read is recently written data then it leads to increasing cache misses and naturally the read latency is going to increase 
now one more advantage of this particular strategy as compared to the right around uh, cash is let's consider a scenario wherein now let's move to the last strategy which is kind of best of both the worlds i will let you know how what i mean by best of both the worlds let me just recreate the same situation again this is the server this is our cash and this is the database now what happens in write back cache is that we just write to the cache okay if you noticed over here we are just writing to the database in write around cache in write through cache we are first writing to the cache and then to the database now in this particular strategy we are just going to perform writes to the cache now you might be wondering if only the cache is updated we need to update the database as well right so the solution to that is the updates from cache to database are going to be asynchronous okay the server's role will be over when the information is updated in the cache and then it's the role of the cache to asynchronously update it to the database now you might be like if we look at the disadvantages of the previous two approaches the first approach has an disadvantage of higher write latencies because we are performing two write operations and in situations where the read access pattern is such that we are not going to read the recently written data it was useless for us in the next approach since we are writing in the database we were causing a lot of cache misses if a read pattern was in such a way that we are going to access the written, recently written data now this is best of both the worlds wherein the cache is consistent it is not going to lead to any cache misses if the access pattern is in such a way that we are going to read the recently written data okay along with it it doesn't even cause higher write latency because we are just writing to the cache so let me just note down the advantages of this approach write latency is less and cache misses are also less because the information is present in the cache itself we are not going to fetch it back from the database in case our read pattern is such that we are going to access the recently written data so both of these are less now you might be wondering if this is the best of both the worlds why not just use this particular strategy now i will just pause for a couple of seconds and will ask you to think it through what all issues it may lead to i hope you think through the issues that it might uh, like it might lead to let me highlight the issues if you have not been able to come up with them so the first issue is let's say there is a power failure or let's say the there is some natural calamity and the data centers break out okay so the database is not updated the information is only in the cache so when the system reboots the information from the cache is going to be gone because it's inside ram okay even if the cache is persistent let's say let's assume for a moment that cache is persistent so if something goes wrong to the cache if the cache gets corrupted or there is a power failure and cache server goes down then we have not asynchronously returned the same information from cache to database so in this case the database is not consistent with the cache and that is going to lead some issues if something wrong happens in between over here okay if the if the write is going through and some sort of a thing happens like corruption of cache or power failure in cache then the information which is present in cache is gone so this is a very big disadvantage and this must be considered in situations where the persistence of any information is important for example for uber's use case okay let's consider that example we have some payment information that uh, for a driver let's say he has taken 10 trips in a day and that information is stored only in the cache and there is going to be an asynchronous job after 12 hours or something like that which is going to write it to the database some issue happened and the cache vanished let's assume hypothetically the cache vanished and at the end of the day the driver opens his app or her app and looks at the number of trips he or she has taken and it's going to show zero just because it was not written to the database now this is going to be a lot more crucial in banking systems or defense related systems where the durability of the information is a lot vital durability is an issue which must be considered whenever we are thinking of an invalidation policy durability is less 
So now these were three of the invalidation policies that we discussed and based on whatever the use case is or the read access pattern is there or the write access pattern is there. If the write QPS is heavy, then the first approach might not work out well for us. If the read QPS is much heavy, then the second approach might not work out the best for us, leading to higher read latencies. The third approach, require, if it requires higher durability, then you should not consider the third approach, but it performs decently well in terms of read latency and higher uh, write latency. So now let's move on to the next part where we talk about some of the read strategies, like how the information is passed from the database to cache if it is missing. Now let's make a note of all the read strategies first, like the previous time, and then we will consider, like we will go in detail through all of these read strategies. The first one is cache aside. Now, some if you are reading some books, the name of cache aside might be something else, but at the core, you need to understand what the read strategy is. It doesn't matter whatever name we are going to give to it. Over here, I am just putting it as cache aside and based on whatever book or YouTube video you are going to like watch next, if you want to, then it might have some different name, but understand the concept at the core. Okay. The second one being read through and the last one being refresh ahead. Now let's first cover the first one, which is cache aside. So what it means is, let me just recreate the infrastructure as well for the explanation. This is the server, this is the cache, and this is the database. Now, let's say there is some information which the server wants to read. Now, let's say the cache is also not containing that information. Uh, let me just note some example down over here we want to access one okay the server has a request for one it looks into the cache the information is not present in the cache so what it does is it fetches the information from the database and it is the responsibility of the application server itself to write the same information down to the cache so let let's just look at what all different hops are there over here okay my bad the first hop is going to be a read from cache now, since it is not present over here, the second hop is going to be from the server to database that, hey, this information is not present in the cache. I want to fetch it from you. The database will return the same information to the server. This is the third hop. And ultimately, the server is going to write the information to the cache. This is the fourth hop. Okay. So in this way, these are the four hops through which we are going to maintain the information inside cache. Now, ultimately, the missing information is going to be written in the cache. So this is a simple strategy, uh, fair enough strategy. This might look uh, good enough to us, but in the next read strategy, I'm going to explain what all disadvantages there might be for cache aside mechanism. Also, another important thing which we need to consider is that since the responsibility is on the application server to write the missing information down to the cache, there is going to be a lot more workload for the application developer considering the cache eviction policies, data consistency, and all the invalidation policies. Those all responsibilities are now shifted to the application server. That is also one such disadvantage. Now let us consider what we mean through read through. Now this is our server. This is the cache. And once again, this is our database. Now what happens in this particular use case is, let us just take the same example once again, like the database has the information one, but the cache doesn't have it. So now when the server hits the cache that, hey, I need one from you, the cache would be like, I don't contain it. Let me fetch it for you from the database. So instead of the server hitting the database the last time, this won't happen. Okay. The hop from server to database is not going to happen. Instead, what we are going to do the cache itself is going to ask the database that, hey, I want one from you, server is asking from me. So the database will return the information one, which is the third hop. Now this missing information is also present over here. And in the fourth hop, the same information is propagated to the server. Now let me just remove this part because this is the part of cache aside mechanism. Now, if you notice, you might realize that, okay, this also has four hops. The previous one, like cache aside, also had four hops. So what is the reason why read through might be more beneficial in some cases than cache aside? 
So let us imagine a situation when there are concurrent requests on the cache that, hey, I need one. Like, let's assume there are three requests on the cache that, hey, I need one from you. Okay. All of them are asking for one. Now, in the previous use case, let us just recreate the same issue over there. All of them are asking from for one. For each one of them, the response from the cache is going to be, I don't have one. So what the server will do is that the server will make three different requests to the database, fetch that information, the same information. Okay, all the three requests are going to return one from the database and the same one is going to be added to the cache. So there are three different hits to the database. Whereas in read through what the cache will do is, hey, I have three requests for one. Let me do one thing. I will fetch it once from the database and return to all of these three requests. So in terms of those concurrent requests, only one request or one hit is made to the database. So the load for concurrent request in ca in cases of cache miss is going to be much less in read through strategy. Now you might be thinking that in the previous example, in the previous strategy, the server could have done the same thing as well, right? If it was sending three concurrent requests and it realized that the cache doesn't have one in it, it could have sent one request only to the database instead of sending three different ones. Now this is an example for a singular server okay there is we are he, over here we are assuming that there is only one server what if there are multiple servers across the globe and all of these three requests are coming from different servers okay now this request is coming from s1 this request is coming from s2 and this request is coming from s3 now there is a global cache i'm going to explain what global cache means as well so that you don't get confused but all of these servers are different servers. They are going to hit the same request from the cache and the cache will be like server one, server two, server three. Don't worry. I am over here. I am going to fetch one for you from the database and return to all three of you. So in such use cases, read through is going to be much more beneficial as compared to cache aside. Now, lastly, refresh ahead. Now, one important thing to note over here is whatever information is going to be present in the cache, it is going to have some sort of a TTL associated with it. TTL is my mistake. Uh, yeah, this is TTL. TTL is time to live. So there is some sort of an expiration period for each item present inside the cache. Okay. So there, if the access pattern is such that there is some hot data, which is fetched on a constant basis from the cache, we don't want that data to expire. So there are two things uh, when it comes to refresh ahead concept. One thing is refresh ahead factor. I will explain you what this factor means and how it influences this particular read strategy. So let's say the refresh ahead factor is 0.5. I'm just taking one some example over here. And let's say the TTL, the TTL is 60 seconds for example. So if there is some piece of information which is accessed on 0th seconds and then accessed on 61st second and like so on, if the access pattern is in this particular way, then at the 60th second, the data will get expired and it will get evicted from the cache. On the 61st second, which is just one second after the data was removed from the cache, it is going to be accessed back from the database and stored into the cache. Now we want to get rid of such a scenario wherein we know that, okay, this is a hot data. This is going to be fetched on a frequent basis in the future as well. We want to keep it fresh. So what refresh ahead factor does is, okay, so let's just make a note of one more term, uh, RAF, I will just put RAF as refresh ahead factor. Now RAF times TTL over here is 30 seconds. Okay, so what it does is, Let's say the data was first accessed on 0th second. Let me just get rid of 61 over here so that you don't get confused. On the 0th second, information is added to the cache. Okay, added to cache. Now on 20th second, there is again a read for the same information. Nothing will happen. Okay, now consider the 30 second marker over here with like since 20 is less than 30, nothing is going to be like nothing is going to happen no op, no operation. And now on 40th second, if we access the same thing again, okay, we realize that this is a hot data. And since this is closer to expiration, okay, 30 seconds was RAF times TTL and 40 is greater than that. 
This means that it is closer to its expiry. So we need to refresh this data once again. We don't, we obviously don't fetch it again from the database because it would make no sense at all. But whatever expiration time that we had earlier, that is going to change now. Earlier it was 60 seconds. Now on the 40th second, if we refresh it again, the expiry is going to be updated to 100 seconds now. So it's going to be living much longer inside the cache if we understand that this is a hot data and it's going to be accessed more frequently. So this is how factors like TTL and refresh ahead factor influence the expiry of any data present inside the cache. So this is just an add on read strategy. Like this can be added to both the previous approaches. Like we can add this in the read through as well. We can add this in cache aside as well. But I'm just explaining it as a standalone read strategy so that it makes sense. Like what is the reason why we are having this particular way of updating the expiry time. So I hope it makes sense to you. And th these were the three different read strategies that can be the part of your overall like code or whatever eviction policy or overall cache policy that you have. Now, lastly, let me just cover, uh, if you remember, I talked about global cache. Okay, so the, there are different types of caches which I want to cover now. The first one being, let me make a note of all of them first and then I'll explain it once again. Distributed cache. The second one being global cache that we talked about. And the third one being CDN. Now CDN is not exactly a different type of cache. Uh, the full form of CDN is content delivery network. Now I will cover all of these three different types of cache in detail. So don't worry. Now let's get started with distributed cache first. Okay, I realize I just made a small mistake over here. So this is not content delivery network. This is content distribution network. My bad. I hope you understand the uh, distribution over here. So what happens inside distributed cache? Let's say, let's, let's go a step back and understand. Let's say we have, we just have one system where the cache is present. And now since your user base is growing, you are getting more requests. You require more space for cache. Okay. You require more memory. You require more resources for cache. But ideally, there is going to be some capacity for any system. So whenever you grow beyond that capacity, you are going to fork into a distributed network. So instead of one cache or one system where the cache is present, the cache is going to be distributed. It can be across the globe or it can be in the same room distributed among different systems. Okay. So let me just create a larger cache. Let's say there are 1 million rows in it. And now it's not possible to add more information to the cache, but our user base is still growing. We are get, we still want more capacity for our cache. So what we'll do is, let's say we break this entire cache into 10 different nodes. And each of these nodes is going to be known as a cache itself. So instead of 10, just for the sake of the space which is present over here, let's say there are just three nodes. Okay, now all of these million rows of cache are going to be distributed across the three cache systems, the three caching servers, let's call them cache servers. So the entire data, the global data is going to be part of different nodes and none of them is going to be intersecting with each other. Okay, if there is some row present over here, if let's say there is data one present over here, data one cannot be present in another cache server. So overall, it's going to be very exclusive. And I'll just explain how the distribution will happen as well. So let me just get rid of the one over here. And let's say information two is present over here and information three is present in the third cache server. Now it is also possible that instead of one application server, it's going to be a distributed network of multiple application servers. So over here also it can be server one, server two and server three. And these are app servers. Now, one application server may not just hit one particular cache server. There is no association of that sort. It can hit any of the cache servers present across the globe. Now, how to make a decision where to store the cache and how to retrieve from it. So there is something now these are known as shards. Okay, whenever you distribute some data, it is distributed across shards. Let me just make a note of it over here. 
सो नाउ ईच ऑफ दो सर्वर्स आर गोइंग टू बी हैविंग सम सॉर्ट ऑफ शार्ड की बेस्ड ऑन दैट शार्ड की द डेटा इज गोइंग टू बी डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड अक्रॉस दीज कैश सर्वर्स लेट से द शार्ड की हैज एन इंक्रीमेंटल वे लेट से द डेटा इज वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव एंड सो ऑन ओके वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव दिस इज द शार्ड की एंड वी जस्ट परफॉर्म अ मॉड्यूलो थ्री ओवर हियर सिंस देर आर थ्री कैश सर्वर्स सो आइडियली द फर्स्ट कैश सर्वर इज गोइंग टू कंटेन वन एंड फोर द सेकेंड कैश सर्वर इज गोइंग टू कंटेन टू एंड फाइव द थर्ड कैश सर्वर इज गोइंग टू कंटेन थ्री एंड सो ऑन ओके नाउ वी हैव सम हैश फंक्शन विच इज गोइंग टू डिस्ट्रीब्यूट द डेटा अक्रॉस द शार्ड फॉर द कैश नाउ वेन एवर अ रिक्वेस्ट कम्स लेट से द एप्लीकेशन सर्वर ईदर ऑफ दिस एप्लीकेशन सर्वर ओके द रिक्वेस्ट कैन कम टू ईदर ऑफ दिज एप्लीकेशन सर्वर लेट से टू वॉन्ट्स टू फैच वन now there is going to be some logic residing in the application server which is going to route the request to a particular cache shard so now we know that the hash function is modulo 3 and the shard key for this is 1 so 1 modulo 3 it's 1 and naturally we would want to request that particular piece of data from the first cache server and so on now there might be a use case where we are going to upscale or downscale the number of shards in the cache so right now we have 3 If we increase the number of servers for cache from three to ten, the hash function is going to change, and the distribution of the data across cache is also going to change. So this is going to require some rebalancing. In order to mitigate this particular issue, there is something known as consistent hashing. If I go into consistent consistent hashing, I think it's going to take one more hour. You can just Google it up, or you can just leave it in the comment section if you want me to create another video on consistent hashing as well. so there is something known as consistent hashing which deals with the upscaling and downscaling of servers let's say the traffic increases you are going to increase from 3 servers to 10 servers let's say the traffic decreases again so you will drop down the 10 servers to 5 servers or 2 servers or even one server so that will require some sort of rebalancing so in this way the distributed cache works now when we talk about global cache this is self explanatory because like since we covered distributed cache global cache is going to make much more sense to you now there is just a single cache system and these are different application servers there can be a single database there can be multiple databases we don't care about it the only thing we want to care is there is a global cache present at some place across the globe so let's say there are multiple databases there are multiple shards in which the database is distributed okay we don't care about it at all let's say the application server ask for some information this cache is responsible to store all of that information okay we are not going to distribute the entire cache data across multiple servers all the requests are going to hit this particular cache itself and the data is going to be retrieved if it is present in this particular cache it's going to be retrieved from this cache itself to any of the application servers now based upon the write strategies and the read strategies that we discussed it can be the responsibility of the cache or of the application server to update the information inside the cache if there are any cache misses now moving on to the last type of cache which is cdn content distribution network now if you have noticed sometimes when the internet bandwidth is not too much okay the speed of the internet is not much you try to load some website so the website loads without all the fascinating fonts and everything the styling is not there but the content of the website loads some images load here and there some are still loading okay so why does this thing happen why is some information present or returned to the user and not the other information so this is where cdn comes into play what cdn does is that it stores all the static information it can be html it can be images in some situation it can be videos but videos can be bulky so more likely videos might not be there but any static information is there you can store it in the cdn so that if there is lesser network bandwidth we can retrieve some of the information from the cdn directly so this is another type of cache which can be used for example if you check my uh, tinder system design video so i mentioned how we can use cdn in order to return some photos with lower latency like you are swiping left and right so it is performing at a very high speed okay so we want the photos to be loaded with as minimum latency as possible and for that use case we might be storing images of the more potential candidates for the matches inside the cdn so that is a possibility so just let me note down some of the information so you can store some static data in the cdn it can be html 
it can be images and that is the reason sometimes you see a website loading up and is unstyled completely and all the text is dumped onto the website itself that is because it's returned from the cdn and it's waiting from the database to fetch the entire website so these were the three different types of caching and now lastly we will move to the part where we discuss when not to use cache okay you might be thinking that if cache is so useful why should we not use cache so let us understand some of the points when we should not be using cache so the ultimate purpose of using cache was that we want to reduce the access time and for that we are introducing cache in front of database so that the access from cache is faster than database but if the access time is almost comparable then we must not use cache or we must change some sort of strategy either the eviction policy or the data invalidation policies the cache invalidation policies some policy must not be the right and that is the reason it is causing longer access times so we must at least either change them or not use cache at all so if the access time from cache is equivalent or almost in the comparable ranges ideally if the database fetch is taking 1 second then we would expect the order for the access time from cache to be in the order of milliseconds so if the order is almost similar then we must not use cache because it's a costly hardware now second reason or second situation when cache might not be that much beneficial and that is when the access patterns are not repetitive okay what cache eviction policies do is that they try to leverage some repetitiveness in the access of data they have some memory access patterns which they try to exploit and leverage in order to put some information which you might use in future okay and that was the pasta example right when we go to fetch something from the grocery store we are going to bring some more items along with us because we anticipate the usage of those ingredients so we anticipate the usage of some data that is the reason we add it to the cache but if there is higher randomness in the access patterns let me note that down as well higher randomness or lower repetition in the access pattern then we must not use cache or we must find an alternative to try and improvise it now the third point being if there is a lot of write qps which is going to move lead to more frequent changes then it will cause our cached version to be out of sync and that will lead to more accesses from the primary database itself so that is also not favorable to us if there is higher chances of the cache data to be out of sync so if there are higher updates then cache might not be as beneficial to us so these are three reasons which i feel can influence your decision whether you want to use cache or not and we have also discussed some of the read strategies which might be beneficial in some case or not we also discussed about some invalidation policies which can be beneficial in some situation over the other and some of the eviction policies which we took the example of instagram we took the example of uh, tinder as well and then we took example of emojis as well so in different use cases will demand for different policies and there is no perfect solution first of all one shoe will never fit all there is no, never going to be a perfect example or perfect solution for anything so make sure depending on the use case you make the right choice for cash I really hope you enjoyed watching this video and you found this content insightful. If yes, do give this video a thumbs up, like this video, add your comments, add your opinions in the comments, share it with as many friends as possible. And if you found this content insightful, make sure you subscribe to Scalers YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the bell icon so that you never miss out on such insightful content. See you.